few different perspectives up here, um, all kind of Great Plains Midwest people. Um, and the thing that I seem to run into all the time is that companies really just don't know what it takes to be funded and like what milestones you have to achieve to kind of really attract the interest of an angel fund or a venture capitalist. So um, could, could, I don't know, whoever wants to answer this, but could you tell me like, you know, what does a company really need to do? Like what level of traction or success do they need to achieve before a venture capitalist or an angel investor is going to take them seriously and want to have a conversation? Ryan, how about you start? Sure. You're, you're, you're um, new hi, everyone. Stage. Just to clarify, I'm from, uh, I live in St. Cloud. I grew up in the Twin Cities, but I uh, bootstrapped a company on uh, the Tiny Seed Talk. Was, uh, I think I created 100 products before we scaled eventually to 70 million in revenue mm -hmm. and exited that company. But I was head of product at that company. But I think there's, I think it depends what you're trying to, you know, what you're trying to do. There's, I've heard reverse pitches from like the 40 top Silicon Valley investors and everyone's criteria is different, you know, uh, uh, but you have, in, you know, I think there are Midwest VCs now. There's quite a few. There's uh, so many funds. I was just meeting with one of the top ones in Chicago in Minneapolis yesterday uh, and they, they've invested 600 grand off a PowerPoint presentation. Now, that's not common, but you can get funded. A lot of it has to do with the quality uh, of your entrepreneurship. If you're a disciplined entrepreneur and you can, you have strong evidence uh, of your that supports your idea, you can get funded off a PowerPoint presentation. But that's pretty rare. Uh, and a lot of investors want to see traction, you know, before they invest. So Eric, you're you're in the fall stage of fund. What are what are, you know, what what kind of stage are we as a fund looking for? Uh, what, good, what do you want to see? Yeah, that's a good question. What I can tell you is the more, the closer, for Falls Angel now, the closer you are to Sioux Falls, the more success you're going to have. Um, we've invested in companies in multiple states far away that may, maybe has a Sioux Falls connection, and that's, that's how they got in the door. But our group is hungry for a Sioux Falls-based entrepreneur with a, you know, specifically a venture scalable company, but that... That's not even really necessary if you're a Sioux Falls or a South Dakota company. If you've got a good idea um, and it's something that, that, that will work, we're going to listen. And, and if it seems reasonable, we're probably going to invest as well. Excellent. Cody, what, what are your thoughts? Um, well, I think, you know, I mentioned this in my talk, but we invest solely in North Dakota and South Dakota. So we have to be pretty realistic about what is success look like on that scale we're not looking for the 100 time upside. That's why we, we use the model we do. Um, but the one thing we do look at more than anything is your growth mindset and the potential market. So, you know, we're, there's nothing against the types of businesses that are only going to have one location or, you know, are brick and mortar and are only servicing a small area. But for us, you know, to their points earlier, investing is everyone has a different spiel and it's very personal. And so what matters, what matters to us is that you're going to have customers in multiple locations and your market is bigger than your neighborhood and your family and friends. Okay. I'm going to turn this around a little bit. Anila, what, what do you wish that venture capitalists knew about kind of the founder struggle and journey that there just seems to be kind of a, a disconnect with? Well, I was going to actually answer your first question oh, go ahead. on the flip side, which is what what should a founder look for in an investor? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> and uh, basically just to say that you should also have your own set of criteria in terms of what you're looking for in an investor. And, you know, to, to Rob's point earlier about uh, they bring the network as well, you know, the expertise, the mentors, like what else are you getting when you're giving up equity? Um, so, and the mindset too. So for us, all of our investors have pretty much believed in us as founders. The idea is almost secondary. Mm -hmm. um, and our first, our like very first angel, true angels after the after the friends and family, they basically said that they were, we had met with them on a different business idea, and when we came to them with this, they were like, "We already know you. Like this is this." makes sense, we're in. Mm -hmm. And so you want investors that believe in you, not just, you know, trying to make money off of you, because you're the one doing the hard work to build that business. Yeah. So 
um, I guess my next question is kind of for the, um, you know, the investors up here. Um, what is a company that you passed on that you wish you hadn't passed on? And why did you pass on them? I'm happy to answer that. So we, we've gotten a lot of interest from the Minneapolis market. Um, and, and there are phenomenal female founders in the Minneapolis market that I wish every day we could cut checks to. Uh, one specifically spoke here last year, Melissa Colsing, who's doing a company called Recovery that is going to be an incredible success. Um, but we have to pass because that's really important to us as a location. And so um, there's been some great opportunities that have been presented or pitched to us, but they're just not in our, our initial region for right now. So that's been tough. Mm. Uh, I passed on Sports Engine as an angel investor at a $4 million valuation. If you've heard their story in the Twin Cities, you knew that was a pretty big miss. But we, you know, we were friendly. With, they, these guys started in a small market, Eau Claire. Not everyone starts in the Twin Cities. Uh, we've seen a lot of great tech startups come from small markets. Uh, we passed on Sports Engine because we had one dog in our portfolio at the time, and it was a web publishing tool that was not vertically focused. We said, oh, we don't want a web. It was growing actually slow, more slowly than other businesses that we invested in. We, invested, we introduced them to a few central Minnesota angel investors, and they're very pleased. Uh, multi, hundreds of millions of dollar exit uh, for them with Earnout. Eric, do you have a miss? My reasons for investing are a little bit different. I've got a great business that, that I enjoy running and that provides for my family. Uh, my reason for angel investing is is for entertainment purposes, uh, along with, you know, to be profitable. So most of my mistakes are, yeah, I invested in a great company. I know they're growing. I'll probably make a return, but, they're, but they don't tell me what's going on. And that really bugs me as an angel investor. So I invested in an amazing company called Cabify. Uh, they just raised money at $1.4 billion. It's uh, Uber of Latin America, essentially. And I hear from them once every 18 months. And, and it's, everything's redacted. And part of that's because they, they, they've, they've grown to a scale where they're not going to be sharing a lot of that, that information. But that, that's really my biggest, that, that's where I get the, the most upset is when, when I invest in my, and they're not giving me any information. Okay. I'm going to ask one more question, and then Tim's got a microphone. So if you have a question, uh, grab Tim, and, and you'll be able to ask your question in a minute. Um, the, the, the next question I want to ask is, what is something that you guys see founders do in their pitches often that just kind of makes you cringe and say, I wish you hadn't done that? Uh, for me, it's everyone says their estimates are conservative. Um, no matter what, across the board, every single pitch, they will say, these are our, our numbers, and by the way, these are conservative numbers. And to me, what that tells me is that they made up some numbers and then like took 20% took off the top. Um, I, I don't know how many Falls Angel Fund pitches we, we, we've heard that phrase saying, but it, it drives me nuts. So what, what are some things that founders do in their pitches that you just say, I wish nobody would ever do that again? Um, I can't answer that. I think, uh, I think founders, uh, oftentimes, should if you have the metrics, you should lead with the metrics. You know, if, if you got a good handle on your business, that's something you got to get to. And so, so often, people want to talk about their technology. That's uh, more. I think more than half the pitches I probably hear. It's all you know, and that's not really what you know an investor is interested in. Generally. Just from a Falls Angel Fund perspective, um, the advice I would give anybody is over prepare. Uh, for those, you have one shot, and, and half the time, just like in this audience, there's like 20% of you on your cell phone right now, no big deal. Like that happens at, if, when you're pitching to a fund like Falls Angel Fund too, is people might not be interested. So if you have somebody's attention, make sure, make sure it's good. Uh, I would just say, you know, knowing on the front end, like I think most investment companies are pretty transparent about what we care about, and you can find that online. Um, so I always get frustrated when I get pitched formally for something that isn't high growth, isn't scale, doesn't talk about that. So I think just just knowing what your what your investors are interested in speaking to that is is pretty critical. Excellent. Do we have any questions in the audience for our panel? Up here, uh, as founders, what what uh, type of rate, rate of return are you hoping for on the money that's been uh, provided? As a founder. As founders, yes. And then I'll turn it around the other way too. 
what type of return of, of uh, uh, as the investors expecting. So. Yeah. Um, so, I just don't think like that. I like honestly, I just don't think like that. Like I, it's to me, it's not about how much wealth am I creating for my business. It's to me, it's how many lives am I changing, and I know that that's going to translate into wealth. So I don't really think in that way, and that probably is part of the reason, um, you know, that some investors just don't understand us, because that's just not how I personally think. Now that's why Samir was our CEO. He thinks like that. <laughs> Um, and that's how, why our team of four make a good team because we all bring that balance. Um, so for me, you know, I'm a founder. Rob talked about why he started a business. Uh, a lot of, a lot of the reasons that he talked about, like I was nodding my head through his entire presentation because it's exactly where I'm at. It's about making an impact and it's about the life that I want to lead and the, what I want to show my children. Um, so for me, the rate of return doesn't matter so much right now because I'm still building, if that makes sense. Like, I, we have a roadmap ahead of us that we want to achieve. And for us, we don't need to focus on a number. We're focusing on a mission. So I don't have an answer other than that. So the same goes for me. I don't think like that either. Uh, other than uh, if I'm looking at investment, if it's an angel investment, I'm not looking to make 8%. If I wanted to make 8%, I would buy some you know, REIT. But you know, it, it's going to start with, over the next couple of years, can I double, can I double my money? And with, with an upside of, does, is 10x possible? But does it have to be 100? For me, it doesn't have to be 100x. It's got to be something that is a reasonable business that presumably I know something about and, and interest me for entertainment purposes and or for education purposes for my own business. But um, I'm not typically looking for, it must be 100X or it must be 1000X or anything like that. Yeah, we're definitely a for-profit fund and uh, we have target returns. But I think, you know, as an um, when I when I think about it, you know, since 2000 to 2017, 52% of the companies that were on the Fortune 500 are no longer listed. And this number one attribution is because of digital disruption. The, the best way we can solve humanity's greatest grand challenges is by, uh, by leveraging new emerging technologies. There are, so, there are so many opportunities right now in tech that I feel like, uh, I, I, um, I, I think you can go after smaller opportunities and you can make a, a lifestyle business and there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that was my business that I just kept reinvesting in and, and eventually got to scale. But there's also opportunities right now and with there's 10 or 20 technologies that are gonna cause disruption on the order of magnitude as the internet and mobile. And we're in a, in, there's a, there's a, and a lot of these technologies are starting to become digitized. And so these industries as they get digitized, you can be a part of that transformation and the technologies are often becoming, their cost comes way down as, you know, they be, for example, you know, the best AI algorithms are available in the cloud and you can deploy them in every industry. So why are we going after, you know, why would we want to limit ourselves by going after you know, something small? And so I like big visions, but start small, find a beachhead uh, and uh, find profitability quickly. I'm all about uh, not, not, you know, kind of being not being a master to anyone, and we don't take a board seat as a seed investor. We invest in companies in the upper Midwest. We love capital efficiency. And by the way, we're, we're two point, it takes 2.2 times less cap, more capital, sorry, in Silicon Valley to preserve a 10% equity stake in the, over the early rounds, according to Forbes. So we are way more capital efficient already. Uh, but if you, you know, I, I think that one challenge is if you're going after a really big vision, uh, and it has strong defensibility, you're gonna face competition. And I have friends that went after big ideas that they didn't raise capital and they, their business got, uh, other people took advantage of it and were two times the magnitude bigger and they had the idea a year or two earlier. You have to scale some of these businesses quickly or competing in, on a global stage. And so uh, I think uh, if that's the kind of business you wanna run, uh, you have to be willing to raise capital sometime. I would say, I mean, to his point, we're definitely a for-profit as well. And so we've got, you know, internal benchmarks that we're looking at. All of that really depends on the type of opportunity, though. And that's a conversation that we have as partners around, 
you know, are we comfortable making a little bit less because we believe in what the product's going to do or what the, who the founder um, eventually will be. But I think, you know, for us, and there's a growing community around this, there's, there's a conversation around, you know, let's invest in zebras instead of unicorns because zebras are real. <laughs> and so, um, you know, we kind of fall into that philosophy. And uh, to his point, there's definitely value in the big, big stuff, but we're chasing the profitability, capital efficient, working kind of growth companies. What's really interesting is that we kind of have, have a couple of different types of investors up here. Um, you know, Eric and I, we're, we're founders that are part-time investors that might be putting 10 to 15% of our portfolio in this stuff. So, you know, we're, we're writing checks and, and buying lottery tickets and hope one of those lottery tickets pays off someday. Uh, but with Cody and Ryan, like, this is their full-time job. So if, the, if they don't provide a return for their investors, they're not going to be able to raise another round and they're going to have to go find a job. Um, so it's just very interesting to see that, that dynamic in, in, in difference of types of investors that or have. There are a lot of different motivations that investors have. Um, there are people that just want to see the next company succeed, and there are people that are, you know, this is, you know, this is an economic development thing for Sioux Falls. I'm investing in Sioux Falls companies or Brookings companies or Watertown companies or whatever uh, to grow the local economy. And then there are also, you know, true financial investors that are running into professional venture capital firms that are really in it for strictly the financial return. So the next question. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, quick question for for the VCs or that are up there, do you guys see, uh, is it more of a challenge for you in finding funds, raising funds to deploy into companies? Like, are you seeing a lot of these opportunities that you'd like to invest in? Or is it more of a, a challenge in finding the companies that, that are out there to deploy your funds into? And has that changed over the years? Uh, I th um, personally, I think the Midwest is on fire right now. Um, I think there's an incredible number of opportunities. Uh, and I think we're seeing a lot of talent come back uh, to the Midwest. Um, we have advisors in our fund, like the first data scientists at Pinterest, the first UX hire at Google that live in Minnesota. And, and so I think that, I think money always follows returns, but I think the Midwest uh, is gonna have great returns. I think it is underserviced right now. I, I do think though that many entrepreneurs lack the discipline to do a startup. Um, and there's different ways you can go about it. You can kind of stumble your way around, but, um, but you do see repeat, you know, three, four, I, I know founders are on their fifth, you know, fourth exit, you know, VC back startups in the Twin Cities, and it, it can be done. Uh, it doesn't have, uh, there's certainly some element of luck, but you can't say after four consecutive exits, you know, some of these founders, it's more than luck. So I think raising, I think capital, is, you know, in the Twin Cities, I think 10 years ago, there were very few regional funds. There are quite a few funds now, and there's more getting started. And that it's evidenced, I think, by the returns that, we're, that people are starting to see in the region. It's, it's really become a hot market. I would say for us, it's more about deal flow because of how restrictive we are. So um, that's a purposeful strategy because that's what matters to us. And so as a result, that means we're, we're never going to have a portfolio of 100 plus companies. Um, it's just the math doesn't add to that. And so uh, for this first kind of go round, it's, it's much more about building our pipeline and, and deal flow than it is about capital. I know in, in Sioux Falls, we've, we've had a challenge finding, finding deal flow in, in Sioux Falls. We thought, you know, this is a, 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 you know, a city of a, you know, a metro area of a quarter million people. There's going to be startups all the time. We won't have any problem. Um, but what we found is that, you know, in Sioux Falls, there are a lot of people that are starting small businesses and retail stores and, and services companies. But the types of companies that um, are truly scalable and can take venture capital, uh, those don't come around as often as you might think. So we've done investing in Fargo and in, in Minneapolis and Omaha and, and, and really kind of stretching our, our direction a little bit to you know, spend our, our fund in a reasonable amount of time. Next question. Sergey. Yeah, so as a, as a VC investor, what are some things that scare you uh, when you start looking into a company to potentially invest into? Well, the number one thing that scares me is when they pitch something and then you look at the unit economics and they don't make any sense. Um, and so, you know, I never know if that's because they've either, they're either lying or because they don't understand it, both are which are really frightening. <laughs> so inconsistency between the pitch and actually starting to look at how the business makes money is, is a pretty significant red flag for me. 
Uh, I think what scares me is if if, uh, if if you're not if you don't if you're not uh, aware of competition, then uh, it's either an idea that probably not worth pursuing, or uh, you don't know your market very well. Um, I think it's probably w one thing that really concerns me. The thing that that I always do first when I see you know. I'm the founder and here's my team and I and I start just doing basic Google searches on that team. And if, if that team is not, I mean, those are your people. And if those people are not solid and they have a shady past, something that can be found on my phone on Google that quickly, I, I just tune out right away. So be very careful who you put up uh, on the PowerPoint when you're presenting to somebody. And Nila, what's your answer to that on the investor side when you're looking at investors? Well, for me, it's, you know, you, when you come to the table to pitch your company, you know your industry, you should know, to Ryan's point, you should know your industry, your, your competition, your customer better than they do. Um, and if they ask certain questions, it's just very telling of that lack of education. Um, so for me, the, the biggest like, oh, they're not a right fit for us is when they ask questions that just don't match our problem, our solution, our market. It just, it shows me that they don't get it, that they don't get what we're doing. And that's, that's super helpful because then I know they're probably not the right partner for me because they're not gonna know what I don't know. If you understand what, right? right? You're, you want investors that know what you don't know that can help you fill gaps. And if they're asking the wrong questions, they're showing you that they can't fill those gaps. Awesome. You had a question down here? Yeah. Um, so basically is like investors and stuff. Uh, what are you more comfortable with? Like somebody coming up to you with a new innovative idea that, you know, has a bit more risk or would you rather have them come up to you with an idea that is like promise more growth in the long run? Matt, can you, I'm not sure where I follow your question. Can so, you say it again? So like, would you rather have somebody with a new innovative idea? You know, it's not exactly popular, it has a bit more risk to it, or would you rather have somebody with a kind of more standard idea that has like a, you know, more scalable, long run growth added to it? So more of a, a blue sky idea that yeah. could change the world or uh, an idea that's kind of a known path that could be a successful business is, is maybe more likely to be a successful business, yes. but maybe not a shoot the moon company. Yeah, like which would you be more comfortable investing in? I think it's both. Uh, Personally, I think there's a you know look for uh, an order of magnitude improved efficiency you know in, um, is, is 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 what excites me. I think the thing is right now if you follow trends like an example look in Wikipedia at all the unicorn companies and then think about what other markets those startups uh, or that business model could apply to and if it's something you're passionate about I really believe in a founder's got to be mission driven. But if you're following the trends, you have, a, uh, I think, a, uh, it's, it's a way of coming up with an innovation. And it, it may not be, you know, the best story, way of starting or hearing a story, but I see so many times it's like there's all these high-level high concepts that are repeated. And as you look at, I've been, you know, in 18 months, we had 1,000 solicitations for funds. You start to see patterns. And, and I don't see anything wrong with that. I think everyone, you know, every, no one likes to, Say, oh, I'm another, you know, labor marketplace. Well, there's, there's a reason there's so many labor marketplaces, right? Uh, it, solve a problem. That's what excites me. Solve a big problem. I think at the, the end of the day, if, you, if you've got some new innovative idea, um, it's about you and you've got to be awesome. But if you've got a standard idea, it's still about you and you've got to be awesome. Like it starts with that founder. If you're just average, it doesn't matter what the idea is, old, new, innovative, not innovative, it, it's going to be tough to get funding. I would 100% echo that. It's way more about the founder than it is about whatever the idea is personally. Um, yeah, ideas tend to change. So we, you know, I tend to bet on the people versus the idea because I know if it's the right person, they'll figure it out. If the first idea might not work, the second idea might not work, but the third idea, you know, if it's the right person, they will figure it out eventually and figure out the idea that will work, even if the first idea doesn't. Is there a question? Cool. 
Hey guys, uh, awesome to have you here and sharing your experiences on the stage. Uh, I have a maybe fun one. Have you ever had someone come across your plate that it isn't proven, it isn't validated, but you've kind of like just been intrigued or you want to follow them? Have you ever directed somebody to crowdsourcing or a Kickstarter or an Indiegogo and kind of seen it actually get proven or validated just by getting 100 people that believe in it, will say they will purchase it, do pre-purchases? Have you ever kind of had anyone or have any experiences you could share with somebody in that pre-validation but then seeing them validate? I saw one here locally not too long ago, um, Game Chest, it's a local gaming store and or like board game store, rental place slash place to go play video or board games. And they wanted to do some upgrades to their space, but they didn't have the money, you know, just offhand to do it. So they actually um, had their audience, their, their customer base, uh, they, crowd, they got together and crowdfunded those improvements in their store. And that was, that was really interesting. That's basically what we did. So those two angels that I mentioned earlier, they believed in us. You know, we pitched them, we went th through our PowerPoint presentation, and, you know, then we went back and we, we had gone to BFRB.org, which is the major nonprofit. We went to their annual conference and we pre-sold units of our device. Like, people's eyes were lighting up when they were trying this really shitty prototype. You know, like they were just so excited. Truthfully, like it was nothing that we would ever sell them, but it was enough to get credit cards. And we took that back to, the, to these two angels and they were like, where do we sign, right? Like, so yeah, you have to prove your market. It doesn't have to be a lot, but it has to be, you have to show you can make it, you have to show you can sell it. And then hopefully one of these three will be able to say yes. And hopefully when I sell my company, I'll be able to say yes. I think that uh, a lot of a lot of a lot of founders, without you know studying you know some of the there, there's you know like the lean startups for example, there's ways of quickly validating an idea. I teach lean startups quite quite frequently uh, in workshops, but a lot of founders it kind of comes instinctively. You're going to try to find your first customer, or you talked about a pre-sale. You know that's an example of, of validating the demand. And so a lot of founders, even without you know thinking about it as a discipline, they just naturally are. Kind of very, you know, it's a kind of it, it, doing the practice of lean startups because they're trying to pitch their idea. They're going out and talking to it. I think one of the, I think the best founders are not the ones that you know try to just sit and overanalyze, but they're out there sharing their idea. They have this great idea, and it, it's a it's a risk, yes, but you, you have to go talk to people about it. You have to go share it, and that's a way of validating idea without. It. That's that's what the discipline's all about. There's just some. Uh, there's some ways you can get better at doing qualitative research and quantitative research, but in the end, um, that, that's it's the same thing. And just to piggyback off of that, we went and tried to validate, not so that we could get investment, but so that we would know if this was worth our time to quit our day jobs to invest in, in the idea. That was the commitment that we, once we saw those eyes light up and those doctors say we've been waiting for this, that was it. We were like, all in about you too sure we've we've encouraged um a couple different women that have come to us too early to check things out for that but primarily it's it's all that's the market validation but the bigger part is that people are willing to put a check behind it um it's really easy to say i've got 100 people who are liking me on social media and totally into what i'm doing but does that actually translate into dollars in into the product um so that's we've used it that way awesome all right so about a month and a half ago, there was a big article in the Argus Leader talking about the brain drain problem in South Dakota. And I think a lot of that it has to do with a you know, perceived at, rather than actual lack of opportunities. What can we uh, on both sides of the table do to change that and keep these people here? A good question. I, I don't know. Uh, I could comment on this. So, um, I think, I think a lot of, so in the Twin Cities, I've worked with Greater MSP a little bit, and in St. Cloud, where I live, uh, GSDC, it's a econ development groups, and a lot of these groups uh, are are privately backed. At least both of those ones are primarily privately backed, but it's the mid to large companies who are funding them. But startups, uh, you know, as it, we're going through an accelerating uh, you know, 
uh, the world's changing at an accelerating pace due to uh, changes in technology. The, our mid to large companies, you know, in order to succeed, they have to embrace, they have to have an innovation practice. So startups isn't about just small, you know, new organizations, it's also within inside big companies. But the number one reason why people in the Twin Cities when they survey uh, what skilled people were attracted to the community, they look at the vibrancy of the startup ecosystem. And so when, but startups oftentimes aren't the largest, largest advocates in terms of I'm talking about the new, new organizations doing startups because they're in the shadows. And so in a lot of these communities, the people are working on startups, but the econ development people aren't shining a spotlight on it. They don't think it's there, so they're not good at sharing the story. But I know you've got great ecosystem leaders here that are putting it in the spotlight. And I think the more you share that story, the more people are going to want to stay and come back. I think they're in, in San Francisco right now, fit, over 50% of the people want to leave. It's, uh, they've not, they cannot, it's overcrowded. The infrastructure's been head office there for 10 years. So I think South Dakota is an amazing place to live. And I think, uh, I think just keep doing, keep you know, sharing the story and bring those startups out of the shadows and promote the hell out of them. The one thing I would add to that is I think if you have any influence with either city leaders, state leaders, county leaders, we have to start viewing entrepreneurship as a workforce development tool. Um, it is where we get net jobs. So the more funding that we can put into the ecosystem builders, because so many ecosystem builders are people who are volunteering a tremendous amount of time and not getting paid for it. And so the more we can actually allocate some funding to those folks to be able to do their job at scale, I think um, that's a critical part that we're missing in the Midwest right now on how to actually push the people who are, are supporting the entrepreneurs. Yeah, so Minnesota just passed legislation similar to that. It's called Launch Minnesota. They have three different grants for founders to, to really reduce the risk of entrepreneurship. So things like a grant for housing or childcare or a business ops grant or a a match on a, if you get a research grant, a match to that research grant. So things to decrease the risk of entrepreneurship, as well as education grants for some of those ecosystem builders to educate people. So the other answer to your question, I believe, is education. It's how do you educate, not just at the college level, how to solve a problem, start a company, you know, know your market, market to them, all of, you know, build a product. Also at the, the young level of, solving critical thinking, right? Not just, oh, I'm gonna go and be a cog in the system. No, build the system, right? So how do you, at a young level, like I take my six-year-old to Target and I say, what do you think that product's for? He can't barely read yet, but he can look and he can use the clues and he can tell me. So, and why do you think we need that in the world, right? So how are you engaging the younger generations to learn how to problem solve, and how are you engaging people at, at our age level to get inspired by what's going on already, amplify that, and encourage them to take those risks? Question back there. Uh, yeah, I'm from a uh, chemistry department at SDSU. Uh, We're working on renewable fuel and renewable materials. Uh, if we succeed, actually, we will need a lot of, a lot of investment uh, something around like 100 million or maybe at least you know, 10 million. So I wonder whether any of you would be interested in this kind of investing on this kind of technology. <laughs> and uh, if not, you know, uh, in any help we can get from you guys, like uh, directing us to some, you know, like an uh, investor that might be interested. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a challenge to raise that much money in, in South Dakota. Um, you know, no, no doubt about that. Um, if you look at the, the Angel Network Fund, you know, that might be a $150,000 check, depending on the company. That's not going to get you there. Yeah. You can look at the local venture capital <laughs> firms. They might write you a $1 to $5 million check. That's not going to get you there. You, know, you really have to figure out, like, who gave Poet money? Who gave other bio, you know, biofuel companies money to get where they are today and really go find, find those funding sources? And it's probably going to be out-of-state money if you're going to make it happen at that 10 to $100 million level. Because the venture capital firms just don't write that big of checks here. Yeah. Yes, that is definitely an opportunity. Any other questions? Um, 
there's not another question, I do want to kind of go, th um, just kind of go through the line here and just uh, have you guys share a little bit about me, your fund and then how somebody could follow up with you um, if they're interested in following up with you. Um, Ryan, let's start with you and just tell me a little bit more about Great North, La Great North Labs and how people could maybe find you and pitch you at some point. Sure. Uh, so we, well, we're, uh, consider ourselves a seed fund. So uh, we're, we're typically uh, pretty easy to get a hold of. We go to a lot of regional events. I'm personally responsible for outreach in South Dakota. So you can reach me at ryan at greatnorthlabs.com. Uh, we, we have materials we like to exchange uh, for efficiency. So you can learn what our criteria are. We, uh, we can learn about your, your, uh, your startup. Uh, typically, that's an executive summary or a PowerPoint deck. And then if, if we think there's a mutual fit, then let's have a call. You know, and for we personally set aside 10% of the fund to invest in startups that are based in smaller markets. You don't even have to have the product launch, but you do have to have evidence that basically it's like pre-selling it, that you can, uh, and it has to be a big enough market, and you need to have a team of at least two people that if we invest, they're gonna work on this full time. So, uh, but uh, just email Ryan at Great North Labs, uh, or uh, stick around for the happy hour. So uh, for the Falls, Falls Angel Fund, uh, it, it's, it's not super complex, but part of the clearinghouse is you have to have uh, material on Gust. Just Google that. It's a, uh, I'm on there occasionally. It's kind of like LinkedIn for startups uh, is a good way to put that. Uh, and then get in contact with the Enterprise Institute. They're really the clearinghouse to get in front of, of our group of 20 investors from Sioux Falls. And once you pass those two litmus tests, um, you got a shot. Yeah, so we already talked about our, our fund, but I would just say um, I'll be around afterwards. If you want to grab a card, happy to exchange. Find me on LinkedIn. Check us out online and at goanny.com, and we've got some just cold forms to reach out to. And then, Neil, as somebody that's kind of been through the process, if another founder wants to kind of reach out to you, how would they do that? Sure. I'm available at anila at habitaware.com and happy to... Happy to help however I can. Awesome. Well, let's give our panel a large standing ovation. Thank you.